Welcome to Canada. So most of you have heard about today from our APH email, which we are not surprised, but it's always good to be reminded. You also hear about things that we are featuring through the APH website and also through ACVREP. And perhaps my most favorite is when a friend or colleague nudges one another and says, hey, come on over to APH and check this out. They have a new feature. So we have that represented as well. Well, 77% of, of you friends that are with us today have not heard about this product, and we are really glad that you are staying tuned with us today, and you might just have a new item to put in your APH.org shopping cart by the end of today. Hopefully, you'll be intrigued. So before moving on, one last time, the opening code for ACVREP credit is grooming. And welcome to APH's Access Academy. It's great to have you join us for our webinar series entitled, Health is Meaningful Living. Today, we jump into the conversation of personal health and safety. It's part two of a series of three. So our inspiration for talking about health education comes from an HP, APH product that actually launched a few years ago, but it seems to be one of the best kept secrets at APH, which is not something we want. We want educators to know about this resource. So Health Education for Students with Visual Impairments um, is a book that draws on the expertise of five seasoned professors and teachers. It covers uh, topics of diet, nutrition, personal health, sex education, disease prevention, and injury pre prevention and safety. This book is awesome. It gives teachers the tools that you need to conf confidently assist students in accessing health education instruction. But we really wanna make sure to pause for a moment and just emphasize that this is not a curriculum, it's a guidebook. So this guidebook is full of activities that will help you prepare for the classroom. And it was created for teachers and isn't meant to be directly just read by students. We wanna make sure that you understand that as well. So we mentioned a little bit here in quick passing, but even diving into the contents here, we have a slide that shares that the guidebook is organized into different sections or chapters. There's an introduction that offers an overview of everything that's in this product. And again, emphasizes that it's a guidebook for teachers and not a curriculum. We have those topics of diet and nutrition, personal health, sex education, communicable and non-communicable diseases and disease prevention. There's injury uh, prevention and safety, as well as an index. Today, we will sort out the details on personal health as well as injury prevention and safety so that you will be enticed to come back and see us for part three of our series. Next month on December the 15th, we invite you for the last installment when we address the um, importance of meaningful sex education for people with visual impairments. We hope that you will save the date and stay tuned. Delivering the learning today is certified teacher of students with visual impairments and orientation mobility specialist, Erica Fendilius. She's a doctoral candidate at Florida State University working on her dissertation that broadly surrounds the topic of self-determination from the expanded core curriculum. And also joining her is Manda Nordis, a person who wears just as many hats. She is a teacher of students with visual impairments as well and works as a TVI, mentors teachers um, who provide itinerant county-based services. And she is coming with us today, featured from Central Valley of California. Today, we will justify the need of direct instruction in personal health and safety we will investigate resources appropriate for the needs of your students, and we'll explore how to embed specific activities into ECC instruction. 
So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand things over to your well-equipped presenters for today. Jenny, would you allow me to, oh, there it is. Hello. All right, Nanda, take it away. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction. Um, as Amy mentioned, this is part two in a three-part series focused on um, health and meaningful living. And so this week, we're emphasizing the importance of teaching skills related to individual health across a variety of areas. Um, children with visual impairments need to understand and learn how to care for themselves, the importance of it, and how their choices affect their well-being. So what is personal health? And why is it important to teach individuals with visual impairments? How many of you watching this webinar live um, have ever encountered a teachable moment centered around hygiene or maybe grooming while you were working with students in the field or, or clients? Um, you can go ahead and share in the chat right now um, what that situation centered around. Perhaps this was um, something related to blowing your nose or having, yeah, having a, 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 a child who was maybe a little bit stinky, um, hand washing, um, cutting nails. Yes, fixing hair, like brushing hair or, or combing your hair. And so the other question I wonder is, um, when you encountered that, did you write lesson plans to address the issue or IEP goals um, centered around personal health related topics? And you can just drop in the chat, yes or no. Hey, right, thank you for your honesty. No, some, like we will notice the issue and, and oh, yes and no, I'd love the yes. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> um, but yeah, in order to um, address this, we have to start getting comfortable speaking about things that might be uncomfortable. And as instructors, it's really our job to notice where the gaps of knowledge are in our students' learning and, and offer either direct instruction or as people brought up in the chat, um, connecting with other staff or family members. So that way we can fill in these gaps. And this weaves into every element of the expanded core curriculum because how our students present to peers and the world out at large can really influence their social interactions and post-secondary opportunities. Um, not only that, but reinforcing the standards for personal hygiene and personal grooming is a part of every student's um, educational process. I spent a lot of time as a substitute teacher um, in K through 12, a lot of time in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and um, uh, is issues around bathing, toothbrushing, using deodorant, they are universal concepts um, to, to support in pre and early adolescence. So addressing these concepts can feel a bit awkward because they are personal. Um, these are concepts that weave into the student's health class, um, or if the IEP team decides that it is appropriate, it can be part of the overall hygiene and grooming goal that ties to daily or independent living skills. Um, so I want to invite you right now to take a moment to kind of check in with yourself. Um, how do you feel about the topics that involve personal health areas? And if you're following along on the worksheet, there is a space for this worksheet for you to jot down some ideas. So we're going to do like a, a jot down check in. So how do you feel about the topics around personal health? Would you feel comfortable and or willing to reach out and collaborate with your families? And do you know what their stance is culturally around things like grooming, hair, um, Nail care. We're going to give space to pause and answer. And yeah, if you want to answer it in the chat, that's fine. That's right. Shaving might not be um, something that we do across cultures, might not be something that we need to address.
Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so um, you can sit with that and reflect later and we will um, continue on. So when we're talking about these skills needed for bathing, it really goes beyond how to actually wash and clean. Um, and this is where task analysis comes in. Before we even get into the shower, there are learning opportunities. Um, so I just, you know, what, what toiletries are going to be used and how do we identify different bottles? Um, this leads to concept development around creating accessible labels for compensatory access or choosing different bottle shapes um, to support sensory efficiency. Um, there's other questions around like, what's the best layout for the shower and can we organize um, it to flow for efficiency? These questions allow for instruction and orientation and mobility and reinforces organization which I know is a challenge for many of my students, like regardless of the setting, but I learned that in providing caregivers with the direction and training for how to best support these organizational pieces inside the home, the skill of organization then translate through all of these other areas. So, you know, we see when, when we're organized at home, I can see changes in their organization in their desk and their backpacks and their, their workspaces. Um, also, I, I um, was an assistive technology uh, lab teacher for a while, and digital organization is another place that, that can really be emphasized and supported through just organization in general. So you can discuss questions related to items that you might share in the bathroom. So you can share hand soap or shampoo and toothpaste, but there are also items that are, are unique to the individual like toothbrushes, um, brushes to apply makeup or towels. And you can talk about why, why we would um, want our own or unique toothbrush. Um, when it comes to personal hygiene, there's also concepts around scheduling and time management that can be taught, um, creating bathroom routines. Um, in our last webinar, we talked about hand washing and um, that students need to know how to wash their hands, the fronts, backs, wrists, cuticles, um, underneath the nails, and that we're gonna, that we do that in order to um, make sure people aren't sick and spread disease. Um, but this is another concept that we can, we can apply to hair, like washing the hair, especially if you have, um, like my hair is pretty thick, I have a lot of it, it's wavy. Um, I have to really get in there um, to like rinse out the shampoo. And is that something that's being directly instructed at home? Um, it might not. And there's, there's social implications for, for hair washing because if you don't get the soap out or if you're not washing correctly, then the, the hair can appear oily, which leads to, can lead to negative social implications. Um, and while we went into depth and detail about skills related to bathing that require direct instruction, we didn't cover them all. Um, I really, in my, in my practice, <laughs> in my own personal routines, um, what I do is I, I begin to look at the activity that I'm doing differently. And I'm always looking for the teachable moment in what I'm doing. Um, and so we can really weave self-determination into a lesson. I was thinking about toothpaste, like the choice of toothpaste. You have a flip cap, you have a twist cap. What are the benefits of those? Um, and from there, you can talk about what would the benefit be of a flip cap? Um, if your student is anything like some of mine, um, this could really blend into a lesson that supports systemic search patterns. Like you have the twist cap, you put it, you put it on the counter and then you lose it. Um, if you have the flip cap, it stays put. Um, and again, my students uh, doing is believing. So like once the, we get the buy in there and, and let them explore what works for them. Um, we can also talk very briefly about deodorant. And I'm gonna have you drop your um, answers into the chat also. What is a teachable moment or concept centered around deodorant that you can think of? Perhaps this might tie into um, self-determination or yeah, cultural considerations. Yep, 
yeah, when your student stinks, mm -hmm. I feel like that is a, um, that is a, many teachers have that experience. Um, and, and yeah, oh yes, O&M lessons, finding it in the store, perfect. So, so see, we have, we have the concept of deodorant. It ties into, um, if your student stinks, there may be social implications for that. We can also talk about self-determination. Yes, spray and roll on, perfect. Um, uh, between choice, between solids and gels or deodorants and antiperspirants, what's the difference? Um, there's rub-ons or sprays. Um, we can support scheduling and routine about when to apply deodorant. This is especially important if we have our um, students in junior high and high school and if they have PE classes. Um, you want to put your deodorant on after the shower, but you also might want to put it on throughout the day, depending on what your activities are like. And um, just like Catherine mentioned, um, you can use access technology on an O&M lesson to go to the store and pick out like a preferred scent or a preferred brand or pricing or, or whatever it is. Like really like health and hygiene is ripe with possibilities um, that weave into the expanded core curriculum. Okay, um, moving on. So while we're on the topic of deodorant and teaching, um, teaching a student why they might want to wear deodorant in order to avoid smells, I wonder if you've ever experienced this situation. Um, perhaps it's not the body that smells. Maybe your student is wearing deodorant. Um, Eric and I were talking about this, that we both had experiences where the source of the odor was not the person, it was actually the clothing, it was, it was a hoodie. And for Erica, it was an opportunity to share with her student the importance of taking the hoodie home and washing it regularly. Again, this ties into instruction um, with, with our students who are in PE classes. Um, or if they have lockers, like take your clothes home and wash them because they, they can start to smell. Um, for me, this involved another potentially awkward conversation. And I feel like I, I just, I love potentially awkward conversations. So I'm going to preface this by stating, I am from California. And um, in California, the, the, the recreational use of marijuana is legal for people who are over 21. Um, and one of my students I would see first thing in the morning, as soon as the door opened, they walked in and I was just met with a, a stink. And um, this was an opportunity to discuss how hygiene and grooming really does extend beyond keeping things clean and really applies to like how we present ourselves as, as like holistically as, as a person. Um, and so we discussed how the smell of marijuana can affect how someone else perceives us, even if it's not us. Like I, I know for my student, it, they were not the ones partaking. It was just in the house. And so then we, we also brainstormed like what could be done? What are other solutions that could be done? Like, could you leave a sweatshirt in your locker or in a backpack or in your first period classroom? Um, we ended up just leaving it in my office. Um, and again, this is important because clothing also relates to social skills and careers. It lends itself to discussion around whether appropriate items of apparel or situational items. Um, like if your student gets invited to a school dance, what would they wear? Um, are, are their clothing requirements different if you're going to like a homecoming dance versus something more formal? And how you represent yourself um, and your personal style is important and you can like weave it into all of these different situations. And so you might be sitting there thinking like, what does this have to do with health? Well, health is tied together. Our physical health links to our emotional health and our social uh, and our social health. And as we dive deeper in these conversations, we can see that even more learning opportunities um, are available and really connect to the expanded core curriculum. So, with um, uh, shopping, for example, we can do um, shopping for clothing supports self determination. It can also be a social activity and support the development of money handling skills. Um, in the previous slide, I mentioned how we present ourselves really encompasses the entirety of our being. And we really want to emphasize how we can present 
from head to toe. And I actually think someone mentioned that in the chat earlier, like the presentation itself is, is from head to toe. Um, we need to make sure that we're clean, have presentable clothing, depending on the situation, um, and that we're groomed. And oral care is something that we need to be mindful of based on where our students live and um, socioeconomic status. Um, these conversations may surround why, um, why one should brush the teeth, um, talk about the methods of teeth brushing, um, getting rid of bad breath, bacteria, that you can develop stains on your teeth um, based on like certain foods that you eat or, or drink, um, but also like how to find access to dental and medical care if needed. Um, grooming is another place that we can encourage collaboration with parents so we remain aware of any cultural influences around how our students present. Um, this also allows teachers to discuss the importance of having their child's hair look like that of their peers. And it doesn't mean that they all need to have the same haircut, but um, oftentimes, you know, our, our students might come in and, and their hair is maybe like a bowl cut, or I had a student who just, she did her own hair and it was a true and authentic representation of herself, but it was also, um, it, it, got, it got looks from her peers. Um, so we, we, we ended up writing a goal um, for the student to focus on hair care. Um, she was very tenacious, very, very, very strong-willed, did not want help. And so we used that as an opportunity um, to, to teach a skill that needed direct instruction. And so my student had a new goal for the year about putting her hair in a single ponytail independently. Um, depending on your student, they could also have different hygiene needs regarding to eye care. Um, these are things like, do they know how to care for and clean the lenses in their glasses? Um, if they have a prosthetic, do they know um, the proper methods for safe cleaning? Um, if their eyes are prone to discharge, do they know that they can use like a warm compress instead of um, picking and rubbing the eyes? Um, can they locate and read the instructions for care sent by their physician? Um, and for our students who have a prosthesis, is there an action plan for what to do if the prosthetic falls out at an unexpected time? Again, this is another awkward conversation to have. Like, we're going to acknowledge that it could happen. So we want to teach search techniques, hygiene for when it, it does fall out, we need to clean it before we put it back in. Um, we teach personal care, social skills, like what happens in the event that it happens around people? Like, how are we going to uh, maneuver to make to make it less awkward for other people, I guess. Um, and really, this is again ties into daily living skills. Um, other questions just to ponder: Do your students know how to cut their nails and why they would want to? Um, can they paint their fingernails if they want to? Um, do they know that they can avoid hangnails by taking care of the cuticle? Do they know that a cuticle, what a cuticle is, and that it's part of um, the fingernail? And what about shaving? Um, do they know that there's accessible tools that can be used for support? Um, what's the difference between an electric razor and a safety razor? Can they notice the difference in sound um, when shaving on a smooth surface versus one with stubble? Um, and next webinar, we're going to be discussing sex education, which will include personal hygiene related to the use of feminine hygiene products and um, like tampons and menstrual pads, and even like proper disposal of, of contraceptives and, and ways to avoid contact with bodily fluid. Um, so now it is my favorite. My, we're gonna pause for like my favorite thing to talk about. So it's time to talk about consent. All of this instruction, all of the instruction that we do like is an opportunity to, to speak consent. Um, it, we, we support our students and members of the IEP team um, in practicing teaching consent before it has anything to do with sex. So what does this look like? Um, well, first, be, begin early. Ideally, we wanna see this happening throughout infant and toddler development, but we've all had those experiences where students begin services, like begin receiving services later than we would like, or they should, or 
and anyway, it's okay. Like there's always like, oh, we should, we wish we had them when they were younger, but guess what? With consent and anything we teach, like yesterday would have been great to start teaching them, but we can begin now. And we should like begin now, begin immediately. It is never too late to teach consent and consent needs to be taught continuously. So as an infant, we can begin teaching consent with descriptive narration. Um, this allows our children who are blind or visually impaired to experience the world around them and give them language for those experiences. Um, we develop concepts based on patterns and routines. Um, we develop a foundational recall through this uh, descriptive narration. It's almost like um, it, it helps to create like this conceptual puzzle of, of what is taking place. So we talk about positioning, um, sensory identification, preliminary concepts of compensatory access, um, orientation and mobility, self-determination, because we learn to use our voice and exercise choice when we understand that we have options and we have trusted people around us who are demonstrating communication. So with infants and toddlers, we, we can also begin um, concepts of consent by, by using correct and scientific vocabulary for what we are talking about. Um, we can teach consent by allowing them to know that their words have meaning. So if, if, um, if there's a, a moment where they say no or stop, we respect that, that, that your words will be listened to. Um, in elementary school, we can suggest supports that teach negotiation. So perhaps the child just does not like waking up in the morning, does not like a morning routine. We can encourage parents to communicate options so that the child can make a choice of when to do the routine. Maybe this is, okay, bedtime routine happens at night then, or that's where the shower um, and grooming routine happens is, is nighttime. Um, we also can encourage parents to step back when help is refused. Um, and this can be a very difficult practice. I mean, not just for parents, I think for teachers also, like being able to step back and allowing their students to work things out by, on their own. Um, and in middle school and high school, the primary focus emphasizes um, boundaries, communication, and experiences that lead to informed decision-making. Okay. Um, and so because we talk so much about description, and what we are supposed to be doing, we just want to reiterate like what the hierarchy of prompts are. Um, there are options, which, which are options for the level of instruction. And so while we're working with students, we want to make sure that we're prompting, um, the prompts that we're providing provide the highest amount of independence, um, allowing the space for a student to attempt the task. Um, so maybe we would pause, we would, we would uh, prompt it independently, pause to see if our students um, do the task. If the student needs a reminder to get back on task, this can be done with um, a gesture or maybe a direct verbal cue. Um, sometimes our students just need a reminder of what they're supposed to accomplish, like what does this look like? Um, and that can be done through modeling. Um, and again, we're just, we, we, we provide a prompt and then we pause and wait. Um, before moving to the next one. And we're going to keep partial and full physical prompting as a last resort. Okay. Um, another component of personal health is knowing how to access medical or dental care and their respective insurances. Um, something that may not be well known is that there are options also for um, accessible medication packaging. Um, that's through uh, accessiblepharmacy.com offers pharmacy services um, for the blind and low vision community that helps patients with independence through high tech or low tech solutions for medication management, including um, vitamins, supplements, um, over the counter and prescription medications. Um, and there's another teachable opportunity. Um, do your, do your students know the difference between all of those, between um, vitamins and supplements or over-the-counter medications and prescriptions? Like, what does that mean? Um, and there are also other labeled medicine containers that use um, large print braille or auditory output for students um, where they can, uh, where they can use, sorry, where they can use to access, um, including script ability, script talk and script view. Um, 
So again, here our role we can we can support informed choice through instruction of locating reliable medical information. Um, we can weave in assistive technology with that. Um, communicating with health staff is another skill um, that we can help support. Um, we can support determining the benefits of a name brand prescription versus a generic prescription. Um, do our students know how to organize their medications? Um, can they read labels? Um, do they use weekly pill cases? And again, maybe we aren't instructing that like, like bringing in your pills and here's a pill case, but we can start developing these skills, um, especially when the students are younger. I mean, my older students like this too, but, but we're, when you're filling a pill case, it's a fine motor activity. Um, and I, I like to incorporate games in pretty much everything I do. So I thought about, ooh, the game Moncala, where um, players distribute smooth stones into different holes. And the ultimate goal is collecting um, the most smooth stones in your like home base. That is teaching that fine motor skill of distributing one item in each slot, which can mimic filling up a pill case. Um, so as you see, we really want to embed instruction in like all areas of the ECC. I'll go ahead and advance the slide. Thank you. Um, with med medical care, there are a lot of um, recommended routines. So our students need to learn the importance of scheduling, which can be reinforced in the school setting by using classroom planners. Um, you can put upcoming assignments or when projects are due, and that mirrors being mindful of up upcoming appointments. Um, using scheduled reminders and alarms can help develop access technology skills that can support classroom needs while still nurturing these positive, like, lifelong habits. Um, again, access technology skills can be used to navigate government and health websites. Um, can they use commands to jump headings and search for content? Um, Community resources can be introduced through scavenger hunts using program-based websites, which is a skill I like to um, use to learn information for prospective colleges, careers, residential programs too, like really getting into the scavenger hunt um, and finding information um, for something that will support them along, along the way. Um, we can also create real life scenarios um, to develop and strengthen students' understanding around health. Um, there are so many different types of insurance coverages, uh, coverage options um, that can be modeled and, and different deductible situations. And when we're work, working with deductibles, that's a math skill. Like what's the cost of a deductible? Um, how much is it going to cost um, if I were gonna get a, a generic prescription versus um, a name brand prescription? Like what is the unit cost per, per pill? Again, we can tie things into math and, talk, and just talk about it. So that way it's, um, it's new or it's not new, um, it's familiar. And with orientation and mobility, we can support mapping and learning routes to medical facilities and then the layout of um, medical offices. Okay, so systems of the body. Um, another important aspect to teach surrounding personal health are the systems of the body. And this concept can be supported through collaborative planning, preparation, um, communication with the science, health, nutrition, and physical education teachers. My, pro my approach is, is highly collaborative. I like, I like collaborating with lessons, with design, everything. Um, and so, so we're, we can move into this instruction, we can, you know, with, with our students and say like, so what do we mean by body systems? Um, you can begin talking about language. Where else have you heard the word system? Perhaps it was the solar system or the transportation system, um, a public school system. And we're connecting that, that prior knowledge, like a system is a group of things that work together. And sometimes they work together to complete a job but the body is made up of many systems that work together to support life. And right there is the basis of your first lesson in a series of lessons that could support a goal 
rich in elements of the expanded core curriculum while also supporting health education. And so perhaps the essence of this goal um, reads, by the end of the year, when provided accessible, sorry, when provided access to tangible 3D models, the student will be able to correctly identify structures and functions of 10 systems of the body. Um, this goal allows for so many collaborative opportunities. Um, we, could, we could get uh, an APE teacher in on the goal if, if the student has APE. Um, we can work with orientation and mobility specialists, but most importantly, we can work with parents. Um, and in this goal, we could target compensatory access through lesson engagement, um, sensory efficiency through the creation of 3D models or exploring um, 2D anatomy atlases, um, assistive technology through web searches or accessing a described and captioned video from their phone or computer, um, orientation and mobility through, through body orientation. Um, the lessons can evolve to include career education, talking about the different types of doctors there are. And, and if you had a concern about your heart, what system is that a part of? And um, what is something, uh, what type of doctor is knowledgeable about heart conditions? Um, and what is something you wonder about cardiologists? And really that last question shows how self-determination is really a part of everything and supported through like a simple question that allows the student to pick something to think about, share and learn and communicate. Like this is a basis of negotiation and ties into so many social skills and it's huge when we consider sexual health and consent. But again, more on that um, next week. So I've done a lot of talking. Um, I'm gonna have us uh, hop on Jamboard. We're gonna put um, links in the chat. And we're going to consider um, where you have used 2D or 3D graphics and resources? Um, and are you familiar with, uh, like which ones are you familiar with or have used in your instruction? And it looks like um, we have, do we have two different? Um, okay, we have two different links. Uh, the first link is for those with the birthday January through, through June. Um, you would click that first link and drop your answers in there. Um, the second one is July through December. Okay. Those of you who are you, this is Erica, those of you who are using um, a screen reader, the keyboard command to find a, an open a new sticky would be control alt shift the letter p like peter control alt shift p so again what we're considering is um, you're just going to share what two or three dimensional um, resources you're familiar with and have used in your instruction This is Erica again. If you have not yet used um, Jamboard and you're not familiar with it, there is a utensil bar, vertical bar on the left side. The fourth from the top is a sticky and the sixth from the top is a text box. Feel free to use either. And if you are adventurous, go ahead and use the pen, which is the tippy top of that vertical bar. And Erica, when we're ready, when some um information populates those Jamboard. If you don't mind being able to share that um, screen, that would be great as well. I could, but because it's two different links, I can only share one at a time. Um, so I can, but it's going to be just one of them. And that is so fine. Oh, all right. Oh, nice. Oh, it's populating. It is. 
the July and December birthdays are saying that APH Basic Tactile Anatomy Atlas. Yes, mm -hmm. Tactile Town, the picture in a flash machine. They are awesome. I used that for making a cover for a um, yearbook for my blind students when they were graduating. So we put the diploma and a hat on top and used Piaf to do that. We're going to go back to that one. I and while you're there's... looking at that, uh, Erica, I just wanted to interject. This is a great opportunity while our friends are thinking about what they want to put in. So we are just so fortunate to have our product manager, uh, Roseanne Hoffman, with us today for the product, the Health Education Guidebook. And she put into the chat, if you wanted to, to see in that, that a release of, of a new collection of tactile graphics um, Roseanne, can I put you on the spot? Is there anything that you would like to give a shout out to? I know this is impromptu. Oh, um, that's okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? We certainly can. Okay. Um, it's just a new collection of about 20 tactile graphics that give um, basic information about the 10 physiological systems um, that are mentioned in the guidebook. And it's not as um, in depth as in the tactile graphic, the anatomy atlas, the tactile graphic anatomy atlas, which was um, developed for more advanced students. This, these tactile graphics um, are more simple and give very basic information, you know, introductory information, so that may be a little bit easier to um, introduce these systems to young, you know, young younger students. Also, it does include. Um, tactile graphics about um, uh, sex education. So they're, they're very um, kind of graphic and explicit uh, graphics. So this product for sure needs to be monitored by teachers or adults, you know, and used with students in that way with adult supervision. So that's what we recommend. So I don't know if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to ask me and um, I'll be happy to oblige. Yeah, thank you, Roseanne. Um, and you touched on a little bit of what I was going to share is, yeah, the Health Education for Students with Visual Impairments Guide. Um, it shares a lot of important knowledge about systems of the body, like the, the digestive system, um, and really offers activities for concept introduction and development. Um, and again, we want to start big. Let's work with our 3D models, um, something that's tangible, and then, and um, that allows our students to understand like the size of the body organs, um, like that we have multiple yards of intestines. And so like, again, I say multiple yards of intestines, guess what? Measuring activity. Like we'll have our, our students cut, cut these out and, and recreate them. Um, and not only do we have multiple yards of intestines, but, but they're put together in a specific order, which again, concept development, compensatory access, orientation, sensory efficiency, all tied in there. And so we can have our students create that 3D model as a preliminary activity to introducing that two-dimensional graphic. And to me, I feel like this is an area of, um, of professional development um, kind of needed across the field, like how to introduce these complex uh, concepts represented in tactile graphics or through transcriber notes in a meaningful way. Um, and the guide continues to make suggestions um, along the, the 10 systems of the body. Um, and also there are lesson plans that are out there. There are, there are lesson plans that are out there that engage our students in, in this instruction. Um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to know where to look. And then our jobs as teachers of students with visual impairments is really like, let's make them accessible. Let's make them engaging and meaningful. Um, and so we kind of hold the space of really empowering our students and their general education teachers or special education teachers um, in their learning. Like, like, no, learning is possible. And again, APH has quite a few supports available, um, tactile graphics, tangible models. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, I believe that this is the um, tactile education, or I'm sorry, health education tactile graphic um, companion book that Roseanne was talking about that really pairs with um, the health education uh, guidebook 
Um, and it also ties into the academic curriculum for biology, physical education, chemistry, and physics. Okay, I'm handing it over to Erica. All right. Um, I don't know if I can follow up the smooth delivery of Amanda, but I will do my best. So when we are talking about systems of the body, as with most everything, it directly connects to our access to physical education. Um, we have referenced in our previous webinar that physical education is the foundation of fitness, health, and participation in sports. And as uh, it directly ties to a healthy lifestyle for all our students. And we have a rehabilitation counselor. I'm sure you know as well um, that it is important to be moving. So uh, don't want to leave that uh, older adult out potentially. Um, physical education programs offer the opportunity to provide physical activities to all the children and also to teach them skills and knowledge needed to establish and sustain an active lifestyle. I think the pandemic um, had shown us that uh, Peloton made a ton of money because everybody was stuck inside. Those who live in apartments couldn't really go outside, right? And we were all um, kind of hibernating for the last couple of years. Um, but active lifestyles are important. So when students who are blind or visually impaired and they are in their classes with their sighted peers, because you know, not all of us are in um, special education classes, um, separate from um, sighted peers, the entire class could be learning about blind sports such as goalball, bib baseball, um, five a side soccer, tandem biking, or even running with no sights because they are possible. I mean, we see Special Olympics, right? It is possible. And such um, actions, when we're when we including sighted peers, it provides opportunity for um, disability awareness and gives sighted peers knowledge of the sports that students participate in, those who are visually impaired. Without physical education, students with visual impairments are a risk at not developing good locomotor skills. And our OMs in the audience know this well when we don't have um, Paralympics. Thank you, Chantal. Um, when we don't have um, a, a reason to move, right? That's one of the things that we talk about in early uh, intervention. If there is no reason to move because we don't see something that we want to get, we are not going to move because why would we? Why would we, why would, why would we move our bodies if we don't see what, that we want something? Um, and sometimes the stereotypical barriers or fear of liability in schools excludes our students from participating in physical education and sport activities. Um, but our goal is really to develop lifelong habits. They know how their systems of their bodies are working. They know they need to take care of themselves because that's what we talked about last um, webinar, diet, right? And directly related to exercise and taking care of our bodies and how the systems work together. We need to move. That's how we were designed. We are mammals, we, we need to be moving. Um, so we can introduce our students and our families as well as the service providers to the opportunities or options that are available. So if you are working with older people, if you're an ONM, rehab counselor, et cetera, they need to move as well. Um, we all too often see that elderly people will sit in an armchair hours on end and their muscles deteriorate, their balance goes, falls are happening, and then they end up in um, nursing homes and pass away. But why can't they learn how to uh, do chair yoga or simple stretches just for 10, 15 minutes a day? And that goes along with our next slide, which is what do we do with students who have multiple impairments? We often don't even think about it. The only distance we often go is to reposition them so they don't get sores. Again, returning and taking the lessons from the pandemic, it opens Zoom fitness. There are yoga classes online. There are chair yoga classes online. Um, one of the organizations I volunteered with in California was um, Bay Area Outdoors and Recreation, B-O-R-P, BORP. And we went on outings pretty much every weekend with people with um, physical as well as um, 
visual impairments. And they moved their wheelchair fitness online. They started yoga and it is still available. They also have adopted um, kayaking, tandem biking, and it really does not require someone to know how to bike, right? Because they are tandem biking. It can be side by side or the reclining, the recumbent bikes, or it can be a regular um, tandem bike. They don't need to see. Those, those are all available. Well, I take that back. Look for opportunities where you could introduce your students for such activities. I think um, we, we are kind of um, spoiled in the California area. But such as BORP, there are also camp abilities on the East Coast, right? There are some states where the students have access to summer camps that are designed for students with disabilities. We don't have to restrict our students to just camps such as Enchanted Hills Camps, which has been around since 1950 in Napa, California, that is just for, not just, but mainly for people with visual impairments, right? That was the intention of the camp, um, but that they have opportunities um, that they can go. and. I don't know if you've seen it, and this is something that I preach about in my classes as well, but if you have not yet seen Crip Camp, please do so, because it will definitely help you form a different viewpoint on social lives and physical lives of students. And again, preaching to the choir, but what are the benefits of physical activities? Why should we, as vision professionals, when we are talking about health education guidebook of APH, why should we talk about um, physical activities? Because um, they are the basic for instruction on clear concepts of common sports and activities to allow our students to partake in, let's say, watching Sunday football. So they have a basic understanding or even attend a baseball match. They can listen to the radio streaming the baseball match that has a description while they are at the game partaking in a social activity. Um, it allows for shared experiences and the knowledge will help them fit in with their classmates and peers. It will give them a clear idea about, um, it will give their peers a clear idea about them, that they are individuals and not just the blind kid in the back of the classroom. Um, when we include the students with disabilities in PE, as I have mentioned before, it gives an opportunity to be part of a team um, which can provide them a sense of belonging and ownership. And hopefully it's not just that token water boy that you sometimes see at football games, but actually being part of uh, the team. And often we make the mistake that we deprioritize, that was a hard word to say, deprioritize. <laughs> PE and we pull our academic students from PE to provide Braille instruction. Yes, they need to know Braille. Yes, they need to do o &M. But PE is just as important for their overall quality of life because PE moving and sports improves their language skills, helps with self-determination skills, increases a mobility, their independence because they believe in themselves, their stamina, so when we go on O&M lessons and we climb a hill, they are not huffing and puffing at 12 years old, which I've experienced. And then also understanding the world around them. And of course, as I mentioned before, it brings disability awareness to those around. So some of the potential concerns of um, PE that may lead to exclusion are often concerns over injury and liability. We do often, adults do not believe that we have the opportunity, well, sorry, take it back. So we do not believe that we have um, adequately supported the development of skills. So for example, I had my um, stepdaughter five years old. I found out she's, she's able-bodied, cognitively intact, that in kindergarten, you have to know how to jump on one leg. Well, the kid didn't know it because he just came to live with me. And so I went to the park and we practiced. We practiced until he, she got it. Um, why can't we do that with our students who are visually impaired? Um, we continue to have low expectations on our clients and our students. Why? Often because of cultural biases. And of course, the pull out from PE. 
meaningful activity instruction begins with play in early childhood. I hope this is not something new that I'm telling you, that it begins with exploration of the hand and the feet, and then continues into the little room by Lily Nielsen. And they all tie together into social, physical, mental, spiritual, dare I say, sexual health. They are all connected. And play allows for exploration. Then it goes into making connections across contexts, across how my body works. So if I flex my arm, these are the muscles that are working. If I kick, then I reach the, I don't know, the rattle that is attached to my um, uh, play area. And it also facilitates with uh, exploration. Um, have you ever seen a child, let that be VI or typical, when they find fresh grass after rain and they just start running, right? We can allow our students who are VI run on soft surfaces, such as if we have access to uh, sand or a grassy area, because it's not going to be as dangerous to be falling, right? And remember, kids are rubber, unless they have brittle bone disease. So don't let the kid who has brittle bone disease to be running like crazy, but typical children um, with less physical impairments can be let. And let them run, let them explore, let them bounce, let them be get bruises. But before they can develop the skills that are associated with play, they need to learn to play. And how do they, how do, they do that? OK, so I could do a whole day on just this one topic. When I discovered Mildred um, Parton's um, social stages of play, I geeked out. And it is something that I'm, <laughs> I'm very fond of. But I'm not going to. Um, but we often do not give enough credit to, um, to play. Um, many times early childhood educators, uh, even though that um, early childhood educators often believe this and that it has been proven that child's play is, child's work is play, right? They learn through play. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, play begins with explorations, with one hands and then um, they play by themselves, right? They, they will toss the food off the high chair. That is a form of play, cause and action, cause and reaction. However, our students often get stuck in the solitary play area or maybe in parallel play when two children are put next to each other and they play, but they don't interact. And that's often because we one, they don't have visual access to it. And then two, because we don't really explicitly teach them how to play. And these relate to personal health later, right? Because they don't know that there are team play, team games. They don't know how to socialize to play. And that is all going to be um, affecting them as adults. So I have a question for you. If you wouldn't mind dropping it in the chat. How do you facilitate and support the development of play? So how do you facilitate the support and development of play? Modeling, tying learning to games, yes. The Mancala for medication sorting as an adult. Brenda, what do you model? Could you put it in the chat for me? Not to put you on the spot. But... Sitting and joining in play. So Rosemary, that's one of my um, dilemmas when we're talking about visually impaired students. If they don't see what other peers are playing with and are not aware of what they could join in, then how do we facilitate that? Imagination and pretending to this area reminds me of a humid jungle. I hear a lion. Um, I can tell you that moving to Florida is definitely humid. Uh, I, although I haven't heard a lion yet. Lots of partying college students though. Investigation or animals hunts during O&M, yes. 
So one of the favorite play of one of the little kiddos I worked with, he was um, able-bodied sighted, was watching ants running about on the playground. Don't ask me how the two-year-old came up with this game, but that's exactly it. We just followed the ants around. Obviously that would not really be accessible, especially on o &M. Oh, that is very cool, Southern accents. Um, so Abby is saying, especially on um, o &M lessons, we nickname parts of routes, creative names like the desert or down south, where we talk in Southern accents. That is so fun. Uh, taking, and then Rosemary says, taking turns on slides and pairing up children. Yes. So when we, when they cannot see it, we need to facilitate those. And I'm so glad to see that you are doing them. Thank you for sharing. And the reason we need to do that is because it all plays into the systems of the body and personal health on the long run. It helps with motor development. It helps with conceptual development across objects, relationships, cause and effect. It helps with emotional and social skills. There's just so much to learn. And of course, when the kids can play and they feel good about themselves, then they are going to be better friends, better people. Who, what, those are the skills that they can take with them into their adult lives to, um, to make their own lives better, right? They become more responsible for behaviors, de develop more successful strategies for problem solving. Um, they won't be throwing sand at their peers, right? Because we teach them that is not socially appropriate behavior, even though that it's fun to pour a bucket of sand on your friend's head. They develop respect and acceptance of others and themselves and their bodies. They learn to um, cultivate empathy and respect, and they learn about feelings of their feelings as well as others. Uh, there's just so much that play facilitates. All right, thank you so much for sharing with us about your um, play. Um, Thank you, Rosemary. We hope that you will um, come back and watch the end of the recording. Um, we loved having you. So as we move from play, we do have to talk about personal safety and injury prevention. As I just said, sand is one of those things that could pose a problem. So TVIs and OMNMs um, should impact instruction on safety. And it starts with those pesky fire drills or uh, emergency drills in schools. When I got to my high school in Cupertino, California, no one out of 140 staff knew or had an idea how the blind, low vision and blind students will evacuate the premises in case of an emergency. Yes, I stopped talking. 140 staff had no idea and no contingency plan on how to get the students out. Just a um, few months before I got there, the paraprofessional who was in the um, room evacuated a deafblind student when they had an active shooter by grabbing the student's hand and running because that is the only thing she knew to do, which is fine. They were all safe. Nobody um, got hurt from that incident, but it is something to consider. Um, so I did um, an in-service for all of the staff. I talked to the um, principal and I went and presented. And I got blank looks from teachers because nobody thought about it. Nobody thought about that the bell rang and there is a fire drill. So the student is you know, going between classrooms. Who is going to make sure that they made it to the meeting point? And those were things that we have mitigated while I was there. But have you ever considered, do you know as an itinerant, what are the safety drills at the schools that you're visiting? I know we have so much on our plate. However, you need to know, you need to keep yourself safe, right? Should there be something crazy going on, like a tornado is coming in the Midwest, where do you hide? You can't get into your car and leave. So where do, where do we put our students? And of course, this is going to be largely um, dependent on the location that you are in. 
Um, safety in New York and Los Angeles is completely different than is rural Florida or rural California or, um, I don't know, Idaho. Um, and we have somebody from Canada, so I think you're already getting snow. Um, that is something that uh, we need to consider. We do want to highlight um, the book itself, the health guide for um, that we're talking about, highlights the national health education standards across the book. For this particular area, I wanted to highlight four, uh, three standards, four, five, and seven. And they are essentially describing um, how interpersonal communication skills reduce health risks, how decision-making skills have to be met, and that um, how students must learn to practice health enhancing behaviors to avoid health risks. So those are all standards. Now, why are we talking about standards? Because when you can write goals that go with standards, especially when they are national health standards, uh, the buy-in from admin and all your teachers will be much higher. So back to this fire safety stuff that I just mentioned about not nobody knowing what to do. Um, in our resources that you have access to and um, you will have access to continuously <laughs> once you download it, um, we have uh, multiple inform um, packets, one from Red Cross, one from the National Fire Safety that are planning guides which I actually make our ONMs to be and TVIs to be to create an emergency plan for themselves in our in my class on basic ONM because I want them to think about it. How are they going to keep themselves safe? So when they go into classrooms and they go across district um, schools, they know how to pay attention to these things. The holidays are here, especially in states where it is cold. We often hear about disasters of heaters and barbecues causing fire or uh, carbon monoxide um, poisonings. Um, Christmas trees goes or unattended candles lit up houses. Do our students, do our parents, do our teachers know how to get the children to safety? Do our older students, our teenagers, our older people know how to get out of harm's way? Right, because that is one of the mitigating factors. So do your students know that there are such things as fire and carbon monoxide alarms? Do they know that fire alarms in homes are generally battery, battery operated while in apartment buildings, they are more central and they know how to operate them, right? If their toast went up in fire, then do they know how to evacuate the building? Um, do we teach them about that chirping fire alarm that wakes you up usually at 2, 2.30 in the morning because that's when the battery goes out? It's like clockwork, right? Um, do they know how to change the battery? Do they know the type of battery that goes into it? Um, again, all these areas can be connected back to academics. They go with physics, chemistry, um, fine motor skills, problem solving. They work with it. So we're gonna take a break because I need to breathe and we would like to see your thinking. So I'm going, we're gonna go back to the two gem boards. I'm gonna put the links up there and we are going to play a game. So when you get to the gem board, if you could please put your initial, you don't have to put your name, put your initial or like a mark or a star or whatever on a sticky. So we're gonna, on the, I'm going to share the screen so I can demonstrate what I'm doing. So on the top, next to the title, there is a little toggle to the right next to all those little colorful animals that you guys are. At. We're going to go to the second page. On the second page, you will see three columns. And we are going to play a game here. The first column is the TVI, the second column is both, and the last column is ONM. So if you wouldn't mind taking a sticky, I'm going to take a sticky so you can see what I'm doing, and I am going to write my name because why not? I don't mind outing myself. And I'm just going to put my name on the board. You can choose whatever you want. And what we are going to be doing is I'm going to give you scenarios and then you are going to move your sticky. So let's say I say um, using teaching body image issues. Where do I think that, oh, 
look at that, the mermaid. Um, where do you think, who, whose job is it to teach body image related issues? Okay, so I will say that it belongs to both. Why? Because the TVI is going to be teaching the systems of the body. They're going to be talking about personal hygiene. Um, the ONM is going to work on body image as it relates to safety and um, traveling outside. So we're going to move our stickies across these columns. So now that we have a few people, uh, Amanda, would you please uh, monitor? There is, there you are. You're monitoring the uh, January column. Fabulous. So here's a question to you, and then you can move your sticky. Who teaches the functions of the eye? You can just grab your sticky and then move it to whichever column you prefer. Would that be the TVI? Both of them, the TVI and the ONM together, or just the ONM? All right. Oh, very good. Amanda joined, has some friends joined as well. All right. Those of you who said both, I believe you are correct. Oh, hold on. I'm going to move that, fix it back. Here we go. Yes, it is both because the function of the eye is going to be different in an academic setting versus outside. So here's your next question. Who teaches how to use a GPS application? A global positioning systems application. I'm going to remove myself from this game. All right, so let me see what January June is saying TVI both and ONM. Okay. Oh, Abby, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Should I move your sticky? It's no, you're good. It's absolutely for. So if you want, Abby, you could just put it in the chat if you want to participate. Very nice. So global um, positioning um, system is. It can be both, but it's mostly the O&M's job. And um, yes, we can support assistive technology as a TVI, but it's really the O&M's job to be teaching it. So next one, who teaches money, money skills? Money, money, money. No, 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 no. Abby says both in the chat. All right. Okay, very nice. It is mo both, fabulous, very good. So let's do um, another one. Who teaches Nemeth or UEB math? Let's make this our last one. Sarah says in the chat that the GPS could be taught with the AT instructor. Brenda and Abby say TVI is the one who teaches Nemeth or UEB. That is correct. Fabulous. So this is just another way that you could um, work with your low vision students of teaching what are the skills that they need to know and how um, uh, how to really um, make these things happen. This is an activity that I use um, with my college students because I really want them to understand where a TVI starts and an O&M begins. Uh, and ends. So you will have a chance to see the roles and service delivery models on your de slide deck. Oops. Okay. Yeah. And after our activity about who teaches what, like we can really like, I think we can make justification that, yeah, it's both. It's collaborative. Um, there are aspects that that one might um, enforce over another. And that's really true with tactile maps. Um, but really like we can agree that it is in the best interest of both the TVI and the orientation and mobility specialist that a student is able to travel independently, which is why tactile maps are essential. Um, and the TVI, we can connect it to geography, literacy, um, math um, for, compensatory um, engagement and core curriculum standards. 
Um, and then we can also use it to instruct in ECC areas of organization, time management, independent living skills, career, um, like keeping a job, self-determination, recreation and leisure. Um, tactile maps and understanding how to read them are, are an important step towards independence. And sometimes it comes up like in an IEP, like if there's an IEP focusing on, on sorry, an IEP goal focusing on map work, it can beg the question like, well, what is, what is our student gonna get out of this anyway? Like, what's she gonna get out of it? Um, and map work supports the understanding of distance and geographic relationships. Um, it supports future employment, being able to direct a driver to different work sites or back home. Um, maybe you're gonna be a traveling salesperson or a supervisor and you have um, people that you're supervising all across town and you need to be able to go to those different um, destinations. Like really the options are endless. Um, and so yeah, learning tactile maps, like not only is it there for safety, but it's also um, supports other areas of the ECC as well. Um, we also need to discuss water safety. Um, and really like issues of water safety are critical everywhere. Um, even if you do not live on a coastal town or near a large body of water, the likelihood of our students being around water um, of some sort is practically guaranteed. There are canals, there's swimming pools, bathtubs, even like just two foot basins of water. Um, I, I live in an ag center, so <laughs> two foot basins of water are common. Um, and, and most drowning accidents are avoidable. So teaching the skills needed to remain water safe is giving them another tool for life. Um, and we also wanna teach this water safety from um, a perspective of lifelong fitness. Um, it can be a, a lifelong health and recreational activity. Our blind and low vision students can do really well um, in swim meets because vision is not necessarily required underwater. Um, so we can engage with conversations with caregivers and our students about um, like swim lessons. And if we, if we do that early, this really can um, serve as like an early entry point to lifelong fitness. Um, and so again, we can, we can um, talk about flotation devices and get an understanding of, um, of what it means for something to sink or, or float and, and tie this into um, like a science curriculum. Um, we can do experimentation um, with a marble or a marshmallow, like which one's going to sink, which one's going to float. We can um, encourage like questioning, like, well, what happens if we put the marble on the marshmallow? What does that kind of represent? Um, and again, tying it to like the understanding of the flotation devices. Um, if there's a pool on campus, the student can be oriented to where these life-saving devices are. So that way they are, like we talk about safety, um, about keeping themselves safe, but also like if they're oriented to um, where the life-saving devices are, they could also then help out someone else in an emergency. Like if there was a situation where another student needed, um, I can't even remember, I don't remember those called, those the rings, like the life-saving rings um, thrown into the pool, like they would be able to do that. Um, I like approaching a lot of learning in a way that empowers our students to, to really step into a role of leadership um, where we're learning to offer support to others. Um, and in doing so, we're also teaching them the skills to help themselves. Um, and this really comes in, in handy because I think we kind of forget this, that many of our clients and students, like if they're not already, like they're going to choose to be parents or caregivers. Um, and if they enter a field of education, there may be requirements for first aid or, or CPR training, or if they enter like the medical field that I know that there's, yeah, CPR training and first aid. And so the first thing that we can emphasize is the use of um, universal precautions, um, that things like avoiding contact with body fluids um, and blood, which is why we wear gloves. Um, the, uh, Health Education Guidebook has a great exercise that we can do about removing um, gloves in a way that um, you put lotion on the glove to like simulate body fluid and then you practice removing gloves so that way you don't have any lotion on your hands. But then also if we do, like what, what do our students do if they, if they um, are exposed to that like pretend bodily fluid? Um, and right now we're talking about um, 
it's like a, a time that's ripe for talking about this because we are um, in a time where we're aware of airborne contagions. Um, so, so this is, it's ripe, it's ripe time to do this. But also just taking care of things like a skinned knee or placing a Band-Aid, those are things our students should learn. And there also can be situations where at home or in the community that, that first aid is going to be required. Um, can our students identify hazardous sounds? This really targets sensory efficiency. Like do they know hazardous sounds like a live wire um, or the sound of a fire? Or um, can they pay attention to the um, thermoception and know where that, that fire might be? Um, do our students and clients know how to use all of the senses to gather this information um, and then pull from previous experiences so that way they know how to act in this current moment? Um, and so again, like if I set the scene, this is going to be really quick. If I set the scene, like what if our student's outside playing and hears a crash um, and they run inside and immediately smell gas and the sound of running water and there are medium sized oval shaped objects on the floor, like what needs to be done? And so the first is to check, being that there's the smell of gas and water and something dropped, like it's, it's really like they can deduce that there is someone who's in need of help. How do we find them? This is um, gentle cane swipes using search patterns to locate the person who, who's in trouble and needs care. Um, do they know how to check for responsiveness? Do they know how to call 911 or, um, or emergency services? Um, can they delegate? Like, are they strong enough in their, in their voice and, and know to delegate a task to somebody else? Or, or do they know their information? Um, like including, you know, their home address and phone number. Do they know how to use a phone? These are all in very important um, pieces that we need to, to cover. And again, it's not up, up to us to um, instruct all these, but we can make these community partnerships. We can connect with um, like the Red Cross or the American Heart Association. And again, by connecting with them, like not only does it um, benefit our students, um, it, it also benefits the trainers. So when we're thinking about choking, we know that the universal sign for choking is um, both hands clutched to the throat. Um, our students need to be instructed that they, um, that they can ask for information to be given to them in a way that they can uh, access. Um, and this is in the classroom too. There's a lot of like hand raising, like for agreeing, like instructing our students that they can ask for like a snap or, or whatever it is um, can transfer into the choking. So again, can they ask like, hey, if you need help, can you like clap your hands twice or something? Which again, reminds me of Simon Says and, a, and another way to like bring games into that. Um, I see that we're running out of time, so we're gonna go quickly, I'm sorry. But we also need to talk about social media because we have our in-person community, but we also have a community um, in non-tangible spaces, people that we interact with daily. Um, this can be apps like YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, um, Discord, or even Zoom. And so the concepts of public versus private um, are, are conversation pieces. Like just because we're on Zoom doesn't mean that it's just the four of us. There could be other people in the background. So what you talk about may not be heard by um, the four people that you know. Um, Commonsense.org is a resource that I used with lessons when I was teaching at California School for the Blind and I was their tech teacher. Um, they have lessons on a, a variety of subjects, including cyberbullying and um, like knowing who's in your community and what to share when. Um, this instruction is really vital as we work to get more technology into the hands of our students. Um, having access to phones and, and tablets and everything is wonderful, but it also means that there's more opportunities for personal information to get shared, um, security issues, um, depending on the platform, and also privacy. And again, like touching on um, areas around sexual health and relationship boundaries, um, having phones and apps provides um, access to the rest of the world without supervision or with less supervision. Um, so, so information that is shared may not be kept private. Um, this can come up with like, if you're sending pictures, whether they are fully clothed, partially clothed, completely nude, whatever it is, like the intention, um, you, need to, you need to realize that there's a possibility that it could be um, shared with people outside of who you intended. 
Um, again, Common Sense Media and the American Academy of Pediatrics has resources for teachers um, involving this. And I will uh, turn it over to Erica for a wrap up. All right, um, no matter how much time we have, we always run out of time. So I'm just going to leave with you um, traveling safety, collaborate with your O&Ms and TVIs together to make sure that you are covering um, every area, including Heinz break and how to refuse um, the well-meaning help of um, people that you do not know, as well as the people you know, you might not want that help that they are offering so nicely to you. So in closing, assess, collaborate, have an open line when we have these crazy conversations and just be creative. There's so many connections to be made. Um, thank you. Those are our references and I am going to turn it over to Amy. Such a wealth of information and, um, you know, it's, it's great the resources that you shared. Thank you for pointing us as well to our product that we're featuring with this so that teachers can go back into the field and the classrooms and feel equipped in order to help um, manage this instruction and these conversations with gen ed teachers. So we appreciate all of the instruction that you have given to us today, ladies.